This conference will now be recorded. Thank you for joining us today for our monthly Campus as Lab Community of Practice webinar. It looks like we've got a, a great group of attendees, and I'm I'm glad to see both some uh, returning names and some uh, some new names on the the call. Uh, hope you all had a great holiday season and you're getting back into the swing of things well if you took some time off. I know Rochelle and I were sharing about our vacation brains and the, the challenge of getting back in the swing of things. Um, we're really excited today to have uh, folks from the University of New Hampshire and Indiana University uh, presenting um, today's presentation is a, another um, sample from the ACE 2019 Campus as Lab curated track. Um, we had a great set of presentations um, that we wanted to make sure to share more broadly uh, with folks in the community of practice. Um, so today we'll hear about uh, programs from a couple different institutions um, as well as kind of some framing for those programs um, and how they're situated there. I will ask the presenters to uh, give a brief introduction um, into their roles as well. Um, but um, we will have some time for Q&A um, uh, after each presenter and then a, a broader Q&A um, towards the end. And you're welcome to send any questions that you have um, through the chat box at any point, and we'll make sure to address those um, when possible. Um, so uh, thanks again. Uh, Please make sure to yeah keep yourself uh, muted until the Q and A, um, and welcome. So with that, I'll pass it over to the presenter team. Great, thank you so much. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Fiona Wilson, and uh, I have the privilege of being the Deputy Chief Sustainability Officer and the Director of the Sustainability Institute at the University of New Hampshire. Um, we're going to be hearing some presentations today from um, both our own institution, UNH. I'll be joined by my colleague, Megan Carney, who is the program coordinator for our Sustainability Fellows Program. Um, but we're also joined by our friend and colleague, Danny Schust, um, who's program manager at of the Sustain IU at Indiana University at Bloomington. Um, and we just wanted to sort of note at the beginning that when we originally did this presentation at AISHE back in October, we were also joined by our friend and colleague, Dennis Kahlberg, um, who is Associate Vice President for Sustainability at Boston University. And unfortunately, he couldn't join us today, um, but we just wanted to recognize him and note that, that BU is doing really interesting work in this, in this area as well, um, and uh, encourage you to check out what they're doing in that respect. Um, if you go to the next slide, please, that would be great. Thank you. So I'm just gonna, my job really today is to do a little bit of um, introduction and context setting about sort of why we're talking about this topic and why we think it's relevant and important and timely. And then I'm going to be handing over to Danny and Megan to really give deeper dive case studies into two respective programs that our institutions are, do, are doing. Um, in some ways very similar, in some ways quite different. Um, we will have, as, uh, as the moderator said, we will have a brief pause after each of us, so you can ask some any quick clarifying questions, and then we'll have a sort of a longer time for Q&A and discussion towards the end. Um, in particular, we'd love to have a discussion with all of you about the future of this kind of work, um, and we've got a couple of a couple of kind of bigger picture thought questions to seed that discussion as we get to that point. Next slide, thank you. Um, so I think you know we're we're all here um, and we're all interested in this topic um, because of the because of our work in sustainability um, at UNH and I'm sure in all of your institutions um, we use the the frame of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as how we define sustainability and sort of define the scope of the work we do and I think it's really uh, great that we're doing this webinar. At the uh, in the first week or so of the new year, um, but we're also in the, the first week of a new decade, and as many people are talking um, with the most recent IPCC reports and other things happening around the world, um, we we and I'm sure all of you see this decade, this next decade, as an incredibly important one. One might say pivotal one the sort of human, human, human civilization. And so this, this, this idea of how do we really um, build education programs that can advance the sustainable development goals? How can we graduate 
leaders capable of doing that kind of work, I think, has never been more important. Next slide, please. Um, so we, you know, we um, we really think sort of in that vein. You know, we we really think that we are, you know, at a time of incredible urgency for building not just uh, you know, a sustainable economy. By that we mean sort of you know, we we are often using now the term regenerative economy. So really thinking about sort of the environmental footprint of our economy. Um, but also an inclusive economy. And as, as I'm sure, like many of you, we define sustainability to really include those aspects of human dignity, diversity and inclusion, income equality, wealth equality. And so um, the programs you're gonna hear about today really do think, uh, you know, really focus on both of those aspects of sustainability. Next slide, please. Um, you can go, we've already talked about this, you can, you can, you can, you can go on to the next slide again, thank you. So um, in thinking about the Sustainable Development Goals, we really wanted to think about, you know, talk to you a little bit about the unique role that we see universities playing. Um, you know, it's, um, we have an opportunity, I think, you know, as, as the University Global Compact has said, you know, in, in many ways, universities have an obligation. Um, how, do we, how do we do everything we have in our power to really educate and inspire students to play you know, a, an active role, a leadership role in addressing some of the most pressing issues that confront our world today. Next slide, please. And we know that students are highly motivated to do this, right? Um, this is a study that was done a number of a few years ago now, um, but the data continues to be the same, which is, you know, when you look at, when you ask millennials and also now this of emerging Gen Z, when you ask them to um, look back at themselves, you know, to imagine looking back at themselves in 10 years and asking them by which criteria will they measure the success and the impact of their career. And you can see here, you know, an overwhelming 46 percent, so almost half of students of this generation, the number one criteria, criterion by which they'll measure their, the success of their career is, you know, is, are they doing work that has a positive impact on society? And of course, you know, earning a decent living and and being able to provide for a family is, is always pivotal, but you know, this idea of reaching a high level of salary, that's way down there at 14%. Next slide, please. Um, another study that was done by Net Impact, um, again, sees you know, almost three quarters of this generation as seeing themselves as leaders who will improve the world's social and environmental challenges. So this is a group of students who are you know, fundamentally aware of the challenges the world is facing. But they're not a group of students who wants to sit on the sidelines. They want, they want to be, uh, they want to sort of step into these leadership roles and sort of not be passive recipients of what, what's sort of being given to them. Next slide, please. And so, not surprisingly, then um, you know we're seeing in studies that students are demanding new types of education. So they definitely are looking to learn more about some of these topics, uh, including sustainability, but also things like CSR, sustainable development, social entrepreneurship. Um, you know, and this is, I think, a reflection of the fact that, you know, students, you know, across many institutions are seeing that their undergraduate education and their graduate education is not always providing for them the tools that they see they need to sort of take up this mantle of sustainable leadership. Next slide, please. So um, the, the, the case studies you're going to hear today are really focused on, on what we are increasingly referring to as high impact learning. But you can also think of this as sort of experiential learning or hands on learning. Um, but the idea here being that, um, you know, what is taught in the classroom is absolutely necessary, right? It's a vital foundation and whether students are studying engineering or English or history or business, um, that, that foundational knowledge that they gain, that's more theoretical knowledge that they gain in the classroom is absolutely necessary. But we like to say it's not sufficient, right? It's no longer sufficient for the kinds of, um, the kind of world we're facing and the kinds of careers that our students are looking for. So we really um, think about how do we, how can we supplement 
complement? How can we complement you know, the incredibly important stuff that students are doing in the classroom, but how can we give them the opportunities to take that knowledge and put it into practice out in the community with, with, with partners? Next slide, please. Studies that we've done with Gallup at UNH, but these studies have been replicated by Gallup around the country, really shows the incredible sort of transformational power of this kind of high impact learning. Um, just one statistic here. So for UNH, um, we, start, we, we looked at UNH alumni, and if they took part in all three forms of this kind of high impact or experiential learning while they were undergrads in college, and that, that includes doing internships, doing study abroad, and doing uh, in-depth research projects with faculty, they were sort of two and a half times more likely to have success in their post-college uh, career. So really powerful data here. Next slide, please. And then you know another another statistic here is that um, for those of you that you know are, are you know like I suspect like us really thinking about how do we can contribute to the state in which we operate, how do we help build a pipeline of talent who can graduate from our institution and go on, go on to work for organizations um, and companies in our state. We find that any student, so in or out of state, um, who interns in New Hampshire while a student at UNH is eight times more likely to stay in New Hampshire for their job after graduation. So very powerful numbers again. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to come back to this sort of idea of like, you know, how do we complement what is happening in the more traditional classroom? And we, we at UNH talk a lot about sort of this need for a new kind of competency. Um, and we use the term change maker. It's a term that was coined by Ashoka, you um, and Ashoka, which many of you will know that organization. Um, <clears throat> and just a couple of quotes here, you know, David Brooks in the Times, um, Arnie Duncan, who was the former Secretary of State for Education. Just really sort of unseeing change makers as, as these people who you know are able to take knowledge but are also able to use that to see those patterns around them, identify problems, and really figure out ways to solve the problem um, in a very sort of dynamic way. Um, so how we teach that, how we build the, both the competence and the confidence of students to do that, I think is you know a really big question for higher education. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, at UNH, we're really focusing on this idea of change maker education. This is really the sort of the student facing arm of our sustainability institute. Um, and we have a number of programs that directly engage students, allowing students to get their hands on sustainability. Um, but they're really about this idea of pairing competence and confidence. Um, and so, you know, at its core, all of our change maker education programs are about, you know, first sparking that sense of purpose, but then really giving them the tools through hands on experiences and lots of great structure to graduate as individuals who are um, equipped to tackle some of the world's most pressing problems. Next slide, please. And so just coming back to the University Global Compact um, that, you know, I think we're not alone, right? Um, higher education is beginning to understand that the complexity of the sustainable development goals really does demand multidisciplinary cross-sectoral collaborative approaches. Um, and so, you know, they've really called on universities around the world to, to lead in these efforts. And, you know, how do we really build a movement a platform for collective action um, that can allow us to sort of amplify the, amplify the voice of higher education and really again graduating you know thousands millions of, of students who can go on to be change makers next slide please so with that i'm just going to pause um, i think really the the, the probably the, the questions will come for danny and megan but i'm happy just to pause and just see if anybody has any uh, quick clarifying questions before we move on to danny's case study okay so seeing hearing none seeing none i will um pass over the the mic to to danny shoust our colleague at indiana state um, university thanks fiona well, hi all, thanks again for taking some time out of your afternoon to little, learn a little bit more about these programs that we run. My name is Danny Schaust. I am the 
program manager for a program here at Indiana University called the Indiana Sustainability Development Program. I call the program ISDP for short, so you may hear me refer to that as a way to kind of shorten that acronym. You know, in higher ed, we do love our acronyms. <laughs> um, but a little bit about me. I am a recent graduate of the IUPUI, so that's the Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs. I got my master's in policy, environmental policy and sustainability in December 2018, and I have been managing and working on this program in various roles for the past couple years. So I'll go ahead and just jump right in, Megan, if you could move me to the next slide. So ISDP is a program of the Bloomington, so Indiana University Bloomington Office of Sustainability. We recently rebranded as Sustain IU. And I just wanted to start with this slide to kind of give you a sense of our mission, both on the campus, but also across the state. So there are eight IU campuses across the state. And so I work with currently four of those campuses. Um, but this is our mission as an office. So Megan, if you could move to the next slide, if you wanna move through these quickly. So we're an office, um, but we're also staff. We've got interns, we report to an advisory board, and we also think of sustainability, of course, as a frame of mind and a commitment both to the campus and to the community and our future. Next slide. So sustainability is really important to the university as a whole. I just wanted to show this slide quickly so you could understand that living laboratory initiatives are actually important to the bicentennial strategic plan and to the university as a whole. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> so ISDP, what are we? Essentially, we are a summer internship program that's focused on workforce development and creating a talent pipeline to get students out of the classroom and into the community. We are really focused on keeping students here in the state after they graduate. Um, I think, Fiona, you did a great job setting this up, but we're focused on that classic brain drain problem. And we're also focused on becoming an economic driver in a sustainable way. Since we started the program in 2017, Students have actually generated almost $250,000 in wages and in value to the different employers that they've worked with. So that's a pretty significant amount of money for the short amount of time that we've been around. And another key reason that we were founded is that we wanted to help organizations across Indiana expand their capacity. So we know that there are a lot of different organizations interested in working in the sustainability space or that have an interest in making a positive impact, but just don't have the manpower or even the brain power to do it. And so we provide them with some student power to do that. And it's a way to train this next generation of up and coming sustainability leaders. Something that we do is we provide all of the students that go through our program with what we call a boot camp. It's a three day intense sustainability training where we walk students through different communication skills and different background on what they need and the tools they need to be successful in their actual placements. And in Indiana, we're also focused on not just the cities, but making sure that we're helping all parts of the state. We're really focused right now on making more of an impact in our rural communities. This picture there on the slide that you're seeing is from the community of Huntingburg, Indiana. I actually grew up and graduated from Southbridge High School, which is located in that town. And the student in the middle there, he was placed with Huntingburg back in 2018. He was there for three months. And Derek was really, really crucial to their success. They're a very small community. Less than 20,000 people live and work in the community. And so one person can have a huge impact. Something that he worked on is he worked on looking at their waste and recycling routes as a city. They at the time had three different waste hauling routes and they were looking at the impact on their infrastructure as well as the cost to them 
to providing these services and whether they could move to a flat rate fee that came out of their taxes. So he was able to do some really in-depth research for them and help them make that decision. So Megan, if you could move to the next slide. So a little bit more about the history. As I mentioned, we launched in 2017 and we just wrapped up our third summer back in August of 2019. We have grown each year, started with 15 students, and recently we had 30 students in the program. One of the cool things about our program is that we were able to provide a scholarship for all of the students. So as you can see, it's based on their education level. They do receive that scholarship up front, but it does come out to about $10 to $12 and $12 to $15 per hour based on their education. And they are full-time positions. So Unlike some of the academic year internships, students really get embedded into these communities and have a chance to really work on a project from beginning to end for these communities. We do work with, I haven't mentioned this yet, but we do work with all different sectors. We work primarily, I would say, probably 60 to 70 percent with nonprofits and governments, including cities and towns, but we are also working with the business sector and trying to help students get a chance to get that experience before they graduate. Um, as I mentioned, we're focused on rural placements. And I did want to mention quickly, I think I just saw a question pop up, but a lot of our work would not be possible without our funding from the McKinney Family Foundation. They provide the primary funding for this program. And we are really, really grateful to them for their support. They are focused on funding a lot of different sustainability and climate action initiatives across the state of Indiana. So we're really grateful to them for our, their support. This past year, they actually provided a little additional funding for us to partner with another institute at IU called the Environmental Resilience Institute, who is focused on preparing the state of Indiana for environmental change. And we actually were able to place students in 14 communities across the state working on creating community-wide greenhouse gas emission inventories. And we are just wrapping up those final results and really excited to share those very soon. Can you move to the next slide? So before I hand it over to Megan, I just wanted to say a couple quick things that I've learned, you know, tips and tricks and lessons learned. We actually have partners apply each year to host students. We always get more partners apply than we can actually afford to work with. And so we've come up with a real rigorous set of criteria to evaluate who will have a really interesting project, who needs the capacity that a student would actually be able to complete this and what the student would actually be working on. And we wanna make sure that these Placements are also mutually beneficial, so not only to the students, but is this work something that will be beneficial to the partner after the student has left? Will they be able to carry on that work after the student has left? So that's another piece of the partner evaluation. We don't want students just working on you know, database entry, things like that. We really want them working on hands-on, real high-impact projects. Uh, something else we've learned is we really try to communicate on a very regular basis with both our partners and our students. During the summer, we conduct in-person or virtual site visits. So since I work with 30 students, it's quite a lot to get around the state. And so we make it a priority to visit those partners that we can or have a virtual meeting over Zoom or Skype to check in with them and see how things are going. We also have the students in addition to creating a summer work plan, submit weekly reports directly to me so I can check in, help with any issues they're having, and just make sure that they stay encouraged and engaged throughout the summer. Um, I think we can talk about this more at the end, but something that I really wanna encourage people interested in starting these programs is to think about funding and how you can keep the program going beyond that first initial couple of years. Think about creative ways you can get funding. We actually ask our partners to do a cost share with us so we can fund up to a certain amount of that scholarship, uh, but we do ask them to put some funds in and we're looking into sponsorships, sponsorships from corporations and other creative ways to get funding, but it's possible to do this work. You just have to be creative. 
Um, but in effort and staying on time, I will go ahead and wrap up and turn it over to Megan. Thanks, Danny. I just want to give anybody an opportunity to ask some questions about your program before we dive into the UNH program. I'm hearing radio silence, so should I go ahead and continue? I think so. All right. Well, thank you, Danny. Um, so my name is Megan Carney. I run a um, somewhat parallel program here at the University of New Hampshire called the Sustainability Fellowship Program. Um, and essentially what we do in a nutshell is recruit students from all across the country and bring them to New England and connect them with organizations here to work on high impact sustainability projects during the summer. We get the fellows to work and learn together throughout the summer and in the process, what we're really trying to do is get all of those organizations and communities to work and learn together as well. Um, I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about where this program came from and how it's evolved over time because I think that says a lot about um, kind of why we do things the way we do. So we've been around for quite a while. Jen Andrews, who many of you might know, um, began the program at a nonprofit in 2008. So she was there working at a nonprofit, collaborating with um, cities and towns and companies and nonprofits all over New England who were all doing really great work in climate mitigation um, and had all these great ideas about how they could do more and do better, but they just didn't have the time to get those great ideas off the ground. So this program was developed to fill that need, to um, give the capacity to these organizations that they needed in order to do that great work. So as Danny mentioned, when she had a picture of her student in a community, um, in offices where there's a staff of one or two or three people, adding another full-time staff member for three months of the summer can actually make a really, <clears throat> excuse me, a really big difference. Um, so that's what this program was developed to do. Um, the projects are all developed to be really catalytic projects that can like get a new idea off the ground. Um, they all have tangible outcomes. So the fellows aren't there just to kind of continue a long-term process, but by the end of the summer, they need to have accomplished something important, which is great for the host organization, and also really important for the student to be able to point to kind of a deliverable that they accomplished during their summer. Projects are also designed for students to really be able to step in and own the projects. And for that reason, we normally recruit graduate students or at least um, recent graduates from their undergrad programs. Um, we recruit throughout the nation, and we're not always looking for students with a 4.0, although we won't hold that against anybody, but what we're really about is trying to make a really tight connection between a student's interests and background and skill set and the needs of the project and the goals of the project. Um, when this program started, it was funded by a grant, um, and it has always been important since the first summer that the students are well compensated for their hard work. So we are on the verge of recruiting our 13th cohort now. Um, we have a 160 alumni of the program and have worked with over 70 partners throughout New England and beyond. Um, and the program has evolved and is still evolving. I wouldn't say we're quite learned, but we are learning. And mostly we're learning from our fellows who are far smarter than we are. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, the program really started to fill that need to add the capacity to get these projects done in organizations. Um, but it quickly became apparent that at least we we're creating at least um, equal impact by kind of training the next generation of students. So while we came to this um, from a different direction than most programs that focus on sort of experiential education, because um, we came to it from the angle of let's get the work done, let's use the students to get the work done, um, early on in the evolution of the program, um, we really put a big focus on the student experience um, and making sure that we're creating a great experience and kind of training these students to go out into the world and continue to solve these problems into the future. Um, in parallel to that, the program was adopted by the University of New Hampshire Sustainability Institute. Um, 
which was meaningful in a lot of ways. Um, first, UNH is a land, sea, and space grant institution, which means that part of its mission is to engage in applied research and make it useful to the communities throughout the region. So this program really contributes to that, to that goal. Um, another great thing about bringing this program to a university was that the program kind of came with a network of nonprofits in cities and towns and companies throughout the region who are working on sustainability. So marrying that with a network of universities working on similar things kind of opens the door for that cross-sector collaboration that Fiona mentioned, which is really going to make the difference in how we can move forward and make progress in sustainability. Um, Lastly, taking a um, program that was designed around students and putting it under the umbrella of an education that is all of an organization that's all about educating students really makes a lot of sense. So with that, um, that naturally led to thinking critically about what we can do on the program side to really enhance the student experience. Um, and thinking about what are the things that we are already doing that are working really well. And a few of those things are, um, that we spend a lot of time um, getting the students to work together. So the students learn so much from each other if they have the opportunity to do that. So we really build that into the program to make sure that they're connected to each other from the start and throughout the summer. Um, another thing we do with the students is that we spend a lot of time talking about the fact that sustainability is plain hard. <laughs> it really is a struggle. Um, it's often messy and complicated and frustrating and that's kind of the nature of the beast. Um, but it's a lot easier if we're all in the same boat and talking about that. So we spend a lot of time talking about the fact that sustainability is hard. Um, and lastly, we are deeply involved with our students throughout the summer. So we're not the kind of program that just sets up a bunch of internships and sends our students out to do them and calls them back at the end of the summer to tell us about what they did. Um, so we're very deeply involved from the beginning with our partners in terms of developing the projects. Um, and then throughout the summer, we're very highly connected to the students. We talk to them on at least a weekly basis. We bring the students um, back to UNH three times during the summer um, to kind of update us on how they're doing. So that's a big part about how the program works. Um, at some point in the evolution of the program, we started also asking for the host organizations to contribute a match. Um, and this, first of all, obviously helps with the bottom line. If they're all contributing, that allows us to have more fellows every year. Um, but more meaningfully, it's really about all of us being mutually invested in the success of the projects and the experience of the students. Um, a few years ago, we made the decision to um, scope the program just within New England. Um, before that, we had had projects across the country. And part of this is about um, really doing place-based work and our ability to kind of continue the work from year to year and keep the work connected from place to place. And if we're kind of within a reasonable scope, we're able to focus on maintaining those connections. Um, and in line with that, we developed a partnership with the New England Municipal Sustainability Network, which is a group of um, sustainability professionals and city planners in cities and towns throughout New England who all work together not only to learn from each other, but to develop a shared vision for progress in the region as a whole. And so we coordinate that network, um, and then we place a lot of fellows in those cities and towns. And that sort of sets a structure that we can build on so the projects build from year to year and from community to community um, and kind of maintain a cohesive progress um, going forward into the future. And in line with that, um, we've kind of developed a third goal. So we are still trying to enable really high impact projects. We are still trying to create rich learning experiences for those students, but our real focus now is trying to use those projects and those students as a way to bring together the, the partner organizations that we work with and get everybody talking to each other and collaborating um, and working toward bigger goals than rather than having everybody doing these parallel efforts in places and not talking to each other. So this is really how we're moving forward. I wouldn't say we have accomplished this, but this is really the focus of how we build the program. So we build it all around collaboration. Um, so a little peek under the hood of how the program works. 
We start out by soliciting projects in the fall from all of our partners throughout New England, and then we select and develop a cohort of projects so that they're all connected in various different ways. So we don't necessarily just choose, you know, the 15 or 18 or 20 projects that look the most fantastic, but we um, set up a group of projects so that those students will be able to work with one another throughout the summer. Um, and as a result, the hope is that then we're opening the doors for those organizations to continue to work together um, long beyond the summer. As I said, we recruit fellows from all over the country. Um, it's super competitive. We get hundreds and hundreds of applications every year. Um, and what we're really about is finding those students whose background and interests and goals are really well in line with the particular projects that we have in a given year. Um, so we do all the recruiting um, and then we collaborate with our host organizations to work on selection of the fellows. And then the fellows actually become employees of UNH. Um, and I'm bringing that up because that's actually really meaningful to a lot of our partners. They have a hard time hiring interns on a short-term basis. It's just a lot of work for them or they actually can't do it based on the constraints of the organizations that they're in. Um, so we hire them as UNH employees. I talked about earlier that we have a shared investment um, with the host organization. So the host organizations contribute a $5,000 match to the program. Fellows are paid $6,500 with a little bit of travel support, and they're responsible for covering their own living expenses. A little bit about what the summer actually looks like. Um, it's a 10-week fellowship, um, but it actually happens over 12 weeks, which gives everybody just a little bit of flexibility if they need it. Um, the fellows spend most of their time on site at the host organizations, um, but they do begin the summer here at UNH. We do a three day orientation, which is pretty similar to what Danny talked about um, for her program. And um, then we bring them back for a midterm presentation and a final presentation. Um, but in between that, we have a whole program of professional development opportunities and really facilitated collaboration. So we keep them talking to each other about their projects, talking to us about their projects. Um, and I really think this, this kind of scaffolding that the projects are built upon is kind of the added value. That's what's appealing to this program for both students and for partners, as opposed to you know, just an internship in an organization. There's a lot more here and a lot more opportunity to connect with work that's going on, similar work that's going on in other organizations. So that is um, basically what our program looks like. Um, I would love to answer any questions you have about the program and also would love to have a chance to learn about um, similar programs that are going on on your campuses as well. Um, and before I shut up, I just wanna put in a shameless plug that we're going to begin recruiting for our next cohort of fellows next Monday. So if you have students who are looking for something awesome to do this summer, please send them our way. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to all of the presenters so far. This is Rochelle Haddock at the University of Calgary. So we head into our discussion and Q&A here. I'd like to first pass um, the speaking stick over to Fiona, who wanted to kick things off with uh, a few questions. And we'll return to Fiona at the end of the call for some, some closing comments. So Fiona, back to you. Great, thanks so much. And I think if you could go to the next slide, that would be super helpful. Great. So um, I, I didn't see any questions specifically for Megan or Danny, but we can certainly do that. But more generally, we were interested in having a, a dialogue with all of you. Um, the, the, the two programs you heard about today, also BU's program that wasn't, wasn't able to be with us today, um, you know, they all offer really interesting, I think, experiential learning opportunities in sustainability. Um, and it's definitely about building that capacity of students, but it's also about building the capacity of communities, of organizations and, and communities to advance sustainable solutions. Um, so we really see these as sort of win-win, um, where the community is getting benefit and we're building community capacity to respond to sustainability challenges, but we're also building the pipeline of graduates. Um, but we'd love 
to hear any thoughts you have on um, it, could any of these models be adapted or improved upon to meet the needs of your campus and your community? Um, are there other models that you are already doing or that might work better? Um, and we're, you know, we're always as a group um, thinking about what's the next frontier? How do we scale up this work? These are both beautiful, high quality programs. Um, you know, they touch you know, 25 or so students a year. You know, how do we how do we scale that, right? How do we make sure that many, many more students are getting those kinds of experiences? Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and just see if people have comments or questions or things they'd like to contribute about work you're doing on your own campuses. Yeah, Fiona, there's a, a comment from Erica Madison, and I'll read it out in case um, I know some people are hesitant to come on uh, over the phone because they're in an open office environment. So Erica says, awesome, do any of your students do projects that are focused on your university, for example, through the implementation of your campus action plan? Yes, yes, the answer is yes. Megan, maybe do you want to just address that? Sure, we often have one, two, three, or four students every summer who are working closely with um, our other work within the Sustainability Institute at UNH, um, which is focused on the campus itself. So definitely we do that every year. And I would also say that that is a great way um, to align all of this work that's going on in sustainability at universities with similar work that's going on in communities and organizations because if we've got a fellow working on say a greenhouse gas inventory on campus we might have a fellow in parallel working on a greenhouse gas inventory in a neighboring town and they can work together um, and often as you know some of this work um, is happening first on campuses so it's kind of an avenue for us to share what we're doing with the communities around us. Yeah, I think, you know, increasingly, we, you know, we, we don't see that separation between what we do as a campus and our education programs. We want, you know, we want our education programs to be embedded in our work as an institute to advance sustainability, both on our campus and, and in the broader community. Um, Danny, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, not the moment. Okay. Hey, it's Rochelle again. I see Joe Fullerton has added in a, a question and comment here saying he joined late and apologizes for missing if this was mentioned. The question is, do you have a way to measure impact of student projects? And secondly, do you have a method for assess sorry, do you have a method for assessing the learning outcomes for individual students and or showing influence to career paths? Right. Megan and Danny, I'll hand over to you to answer that. I would say that's a great question and a great challenge. <laughs> um, so we do try to set up our projects, um, like I said, so they definitely have an outcome um, and those outcomes are often developed so that there can be measurable impacts associated with them. Um, and the challenge is like, I feel like it could be, I could spend half of my time chasing the 160 projects that we've done to see what happens to them after the fact. And that's um, that's really where I think the impact is. While there may be an impact during the 10 weeks of the summer, the impact is really what happens after the student has done that catalytic work during the summer, a year later, two years later, 10 years later. Um, and we have not honestly not figured out how to crack that, not just in terms of having the capacity to do all of that chasing. Um, and similar with learning outcomes, because all of our projects are very different and our fellows are coming from very different places, we don't have sort of a standard set of learning outcomes for the program, um, which makes it similarly difficult to measure that. Um, all of that said, if anybody has ideas they would like to share on how that is more doable, I would love to hear. Danny, anything you'd like to add there? Yeah, I, I would just echo what Megan said, that we don't have a necessarily set amount of learning outcomes for students. And we are also trying to figure out ways to best measure the impact that students have. 
Um, we're a fairly new program, young program, so we're still figuring that out. But I would say anecdotally, we've definitely seen that students are more likely to stay in the state after they graduate, which was why we were started, and that many organizations either add new sustainability roles or some organizations have actually started completely new sustainability departments that didn't exist before. So we know we're making an impact. We're just trying to figure out the best ways to measure that. And like Megan said, do all of our day-to-day -day tasks as well. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, I think I'll just add to that a couple of things. I mean, I think, I think the question is, is an entirely sort of appropriate one. And I think it's a really big topic for all of us in sort of experiential education right now. Um, you know, we, we want to be sure that we're doing experiential education in a rigorous, high quality way. And we want to be sure that it's having those sort of those transformational outcomes that that is sort of the promise of this kind of learning. Um, you know, I, I think one thing that I'll just add to what Megan is saying is that we do have, you know, qualitative, if not quantitative data on sort of what is happening to the graduates of this program and, and our many other programs. Um, that are all sort of experiential and focused on sustainability that, you know, we are seeing, we did a, a study about a year or two ago of students in all across all of our programs and um, over 50% of them are in careers now that we, we coded as kind of sustainability related. So, you know, I mean, there's obviously some methodological issues there that, you know, probably the students who are coming into our programs are the ones who are most interested in these kinds of careers. But I think at the very least, we can say that for many of the students, you know, these experiences in these programs are leading to the kinds of careers that they want. So it's helping them succeed and getting those placements. Um, I, I would also just add um, one of the other programs that we that we're involved in here at UNH is called Semester in the City. Um, and it is a it is a curricular model. It's, it's a full semester of academic credit working in um, social sector environmental impact organizations um, right now it's just happening in the city of boston but it is open to students from um, any four-year um, university um, students are able to do it through uh, through unh and transferring credit back to their home institution um, in that program we uh, because it is curricular we have a very robust um, set of learning outcomes and a lot of we do a lot of pre and post assessment that is quantitative in nature. Um, we've actually just written that up. It's a it's a chapter in um, the Ashoka U um, U um, learning outcomes and evaluation uh, publication that just came out. Um, so I'm happy I can put the link up to that. But I would highly recommend you check out the way that Semester in the City is is doing that kind of work. I think it's sort of best in class um, that I am aware of at the moment. Wonderful. Thank you for your responses. We have uh, another question here from Jamie Valentine. Do you assist interns in locating short-term housing? And how much of the relocating process do you take on? And, she, um, and Jamie's saying specifically for students going to rural areas. Danny, you want to say yeah. that? Yeah, Megan, Danny, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think I heard part of the question. So basically the question was how we help students assist or uh, find housing. Yeah, so we rely, in the past, we've relied pretty heavily on our partners to help identify local options. But something I'm really excited about is we're actually this year going to be launching a separate housing scholarship. So students could apply for some additional funding in addition to their main scholarship to help them relocate pay for any down payments, things like that. So we are actually gonna be providing a little financial help and we do ask the partners pr to provide some local options that are affordable and short term as well. And I would say basically the same thing. So for, um, we don't provide housing and we don't you know, guarantee housing, but we provide resources and try to help the students get set up. And so if those students are located in places that we're not so familiar with, we rely on our partners to help out with that, um, which has always been successful so far. Hey, you have a lot of questions rolling in here. So I will uh, flag the next one from Carrie 
she mentions, uh, apologizes if this was mentioned, but do you prepare students to engage with different knowledge types and or cultural differences that they may engage with during their internships? In other words, how do you prepare students to become integrated into partner institutions or communities? Megan, do you want to check in? Sure. Um, that is definitely a part of our orientation program. We usually do a session about that. Um, and if we're able, um, and in the past couple of years, that's become part of sort of our continuing conversation throughout the summer. So as I mentioned, we talk to them at least on a weekly basis. Um, and those conversations can take many different formats, but often it's a prompt to have a discussion. Um, and that has been one of the focuses the past couple summers um, for our program, just in terms of, because students are coming from all over the place, they have all different backgrounds, and then they're going into all different sorts of organizations and communities. Um, and so I'm not sure that we have really cracked the nut on the best way to approach it, but we're sort of laying it open that we all need to be talking about this constantly. And so we begin on day one when the students come to us in the summer and we just keep the conversation going throughout the summer. Danny? Yeah. So similarly, we do a little bit of communications training, particularly for students that are going into rural communities. Uh, we, here in Indiana, we are still struggling to say climate change and to use that language. So we do try to have those really frank conversations with students that you may be working with people who don't believe in climate change and how are you going to complete your work and be respectful to that person's um, mindset and their beliefs and still get your work done. And so we do some communications training on that. We've also brought in um, a researcher from the Purdue Climate Climate Change Research Center to do some county specific and Indiana specific data on climate change and how it's directly impacting the state. And so those students can then access that and have those conversations. But we are still trying to figure out other ways that we can incorporate cultural competency and communication skills into that training. Okay, great. We have uh, an idea from Joe Fullerton to scale up. He suggests partnering with local community college and high school partners uh, and then have bachelor above level students who teach other students um, could be a wonderful way of creating a vertical value chain of education. Very nice. I like that. So uh, that comments there in the, in the thread for you to consider as a scaling up tool. Yeah, Perhaps you can answer one more question before we head to Fiona for her closing comments. Uh, this one's from Angie Gregory, who asks, have any of you worked with faculty to embed these projects into the curriculum as a method to raise the, raise the level for all students across the college and for students to see the actual need and interplay for different knowledge bases to collaborate in sustainability conversations, applied learning to the coursework? Okay. Apologies for <laughs> butchering the question, but I think it's a good one. Um, if so, could you provide, uh, if so, what feedback on that process could you provide? So I think if it's okay, Megan and Danny, maybe I'll just take that and um, just, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk just about a, another program we have here at UNH. Um, I think, you know, we, we love our summer programs. Um, we think it's great that students use their summers for this kind of really pivotal co-curricular work. Um, and you've heard, you know, really Two examples of really high quality, really thoughtful, thoughtfully constructed, constructed programs. But at UNH, we've really begun to believe that, you know, if these kinds of you know, high quality, high impact experiences are so important as part of an education today and are so important for advancing sustainability, we think they should also be embedded in the curriculum. So about three and a half years ago, we, we entered into a partnership with a nonprofit called the College for Social Innovation. And we were the first university to offer a program called Semester in the City to our students. Um, we, we now have data from a three, three, oh, plus three, three plus year pilot. Um, and we are also um, making that program available to other universities we have um, consortium agreements with a number of other universities. We act as the university of record and other universities are able to send their students to that program. Um, it's a model where uh, it's fully, fully credit for credits. 
16 credits, the equivalent of four classes. They spend the entire semester in the city of Boston. Four days a week, they're in a, a similar internship or fellowship. Um, and then Wednesday nights and all day Friday, they're in the classroom doing reflection, doing problem solving, learning from one another and building sort of a set of professional skills um, as they go through the 15 week process. Um, and, and, and in that work, we work probably now with about 20 different um, departments across campus um, who are allowing students to count that experience for credit towards their major. Um, so we, we agree that it, it is that is sort of one of the next frontiers is how do we make this work kind of part of the curriculum as well as being co-curricular. And I posted a link to that program um, in the chat if anybody is interested or can follow up with me afterwards for, for more information. Thank you, Fiona. We, we are approaching the end of our webinar. Did you want to add any additional concluding remarks or any of the other speakers? No, just to say I think thank you so much for having us. And uh, we, as you can hear, we're um, Megan, Danny, we're all passionate about the work we do. and. Um, we're happy to answer questions offline as well. Um, and thanks everyone for being part of this. We really appreciate it. Yes, well, and thanks again for, for sharing your knowledge and, and experience and, and passion for this work. Uh, you definitely, uh, I think, have a lot of interest from, from the membership of our community of practice. And, and I hope people will feel empowered to, to reach out to any of the presenters and to continue to have a conversation about how to advance this work and, and to start to tackle some of the questions, those critical closing questions um, that Fiona shared. And I see some excellent closing thoughts here as well, much more eloquent than, than myself. So uh, without further ado, uh, we will close off uh, this call. We are looking forward to our February call. And you can expect an announcement in your email about uh, the subject for that call. And wish you all a very happy new year. And uh, uh, here's to the great work we will all achieve in that next pivotal and, and critical decade. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.